A reading from the second book of Kings. A man came from Baal Shalisha, bringing to Elijah, the man of God, 20 barley loaves made from the first fruits and fresh grain in the ear. Elijah said, give it to the people to eat. But his servant objected. How can I set this before a hundred people? Elijah insisted, give it to the people to eat. For thus says the Lord, they shall eat and there shall be some left over. And when they had eaten, there was some left over, as the Lord had said. The word of the Lord. reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Ephesians. Brothers and sisters, I, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to live in a manner worthy of the call you have received, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another through love striving to preserve the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. One body and one spirit, as you were also called to one hope of your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all, and in all. The word of the Lord.
Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Jesus went across the Sea of Galilee. A large crowd followed him because they saw the signs he was performing on the sick. Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. The Jewish feast of the Passover was near. When Jesus raised his eyes and he saw that a large crowd was coming to him, he said to Philip, where can we buy enough food for them to eat? He said this to test him, because he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, 200 days wages worth of food would not be enough for each of them to have a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, the brother of Simon Peter, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what good are these for so many? Jesus said, Have the people recline. Now there was a great deal of grass in that place, so the men reclined, about 5,000 in number. Then Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed them to those who were reclining, and also as much fish as they wanted. When they had had their fill, Jesus said to the disciples, gather the fragments left over so that nothing will be wasted. So they collected them and filled five wicker baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves that had been more than they could eat. When the people saw the sign he had done, they said, This is truly the prophet, the one who is to come into the world. Since Jesus knew that they were going to come and carry him off to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain alone. The Gospel of the Lord. Welcome to the 17th Sunday of Ordinary Time. It's a big deal, you guys. It's a big deal. In chapter 4 of John's Gospel, we read of an encounter that Jesus had with the Samaritan woman and led Jesus to explore the image of himself as living water. Today, we read of the sign that John tells us about allows Jesus to explore the image that's at the center of our faith, which is Jesus is the bread of life. We're currently in cycle B of our lectionary, and usually during cycle B, we hear from the Gospel of Mark. In the last two Sundays, we've heard how Jesus sent out his disciples to share in his mission. If we were continuing to read Mark's gospel, what we would hear next is a multiplication of the loaves, just like we heard today in John's. Our lectionary, what will happen is that now diverts from Mark to John for the next few weeks where we hear about the bread of life discourse. The story of the multiplication is a very, very important story for the early church. To put its importance into perspective, and you look at all four Gospels, in all four Gospels, there are two versions of Jesus' death. There are four versions of Jesus. Did I say death? Two versions of Jesus' birth. Four versions of Jesus' death. But there are six versions of the multiplication. No doubt, This is a miracle story. What we heard in the gospel today, the word miracle was not used. The word used was signs. In John's gospel, he does not talk about miracles. He talks about signs. Those signs that will lead us to the divinity of Jesus and God. We'll use miracles. This is a miracle story. But it's also a teaching moment for the disciples and us as well. When we look at this reading as a teaching moment, what the disciples see is not necessarily Jesus' compassion, 
for the hungry and the shepherdless crowd because the disciples, they've already experienced this. The lesson that Jesus is to teach the disciples and ourselves is not to underestimate his power for a solution to our physical and more importantly, our spiritual needs. The story begins with the disciples coming back from their mission. They've been sent out in groups of two to preach, to heal, to expel demons all across the countryside. And when the disciples come back, they're really excited because guess what? It worked. They were amazed. They were astounded. And they told Jesus all they had done. Even though they just gotten back from performing all these miracles, suddenly, once again, they appeared to be helpless. They look at what they had, or in this case, what they didn't have. They knew that it was inadequate. So the conclusion was there was nothing that they could do. Jesus, he was testing them. He was testing to see if the disciples' vision was in alignment with his vision. I had the honor and pleasure of working with this amazing man. And this amazing man, he taught me so much. And one day he called in sick. And I was really concerned because he never, ever called in sick. When he returned, I was really concerned. And I asked him, are you okay? He told me I was having trouble seeing. And I gasped. And he continued, I just couldn't see coming to work yesterday. Vision, it's subjective. It's in the eye of the beholder. Well, the disciples, they had their own issues with their vision. The disciples, they had one vision of the situation. Jesus' vision was completely different. The disciples, they were putting a limit on what to expect. But Jesus, Jesus didn't have a limit. The disciples' vision, it was small, it was earthly, but the vision of Jesus, it was heavenly, it was limitless. So, in this situation, perspective really is reality. There are times that we too doubt that God will provide for us. Many times we don't ask God or pray to God to provide for us. Many times we don't do this because in our earthly hearts, in our earthly minds, we feel what we're asking, it's impossible. But part of growing in our faith is learning to ask for the impossible, to ask God to act, to ask God to be present in our thoughts and in our deeds and all our words. It seems so simple to say this, but if you think about it, it is an absolute profound act of faith to put your trust in the Lord. It's pretty easy for us to look at the disciples today and be critical. We think to ourselves, they should have known better. They walked with Jesus. They talked with Jesus. They witnessed his miracles. They should have known better. We ourselves, we have the advantage of hindsight. But let me ask you a question. Would you have known any better? I think we should ask ourselves, why don't we have more faith? In this situation the disciples encountered, would we have had more faith? I think we need to read the story about the disciples, not as critics, but more as students. So... With that being said, what are the takeaways from this story? What can we learn from the disciples? I think the first thing we can learn, successes of yesterday are not enough. We have to get up every day and climb that mountain every single day because today it's a new day. It's a day once again we must completely rely on God's power as much as we've done in the past. Secondly, if we see a need, 
we should attempt to meet that need. And our starting point should be not with our resources, but rather what that need is. And lastly, our limited resources plus Jesus equals more than enough. I don't think the disciples were ever expected to feed the crowd on their own. And as church, I don't think we ourselves alone are expected to minister completely to this church, to our community and the world at large. Let us look at our time, our treasure, and our talent and invite Jesus to multiply it. What we're invited to do is to lift it up to God. Lift it up to God. How many times have I stood up here and told you guys to lift it up to God? Number of times I've talked to you if we had problems. What I tell you to do, lift it up to God. I've used this term many times. Like the disciples, we encounter life's problems as well. And like the disciples in today's gospel, we tend to seek purely earthly solutions to our earthly problems. Lift it up to God. I began to think, do I even really know what that means? Sounds really good, but I really didn't know. One of the advantages to preaching is that you have to prepare. You read. You pray. You discern. You read more, and you read more, and you read more. So I thought, what does it mean to lift up God? Well, I found a resource, and this resource said, first, we have to admit that we have a problem. We have to admit we have an issue. In this particular problem or issue, we can't solve it solely by ourselves. What we do next is give thanks. I'm not saying that we give thanks, especially for the severe problems, and think they're a gift. What I'm saying is that we have to have an attitude of gratitude and, think, and thank God for the many, many things that he has given us in our lives. Sometimes we tend to focus more on what we don't have or what we lack rather than what we actually have. Then we bless these gifts. And what is meant by this is we force ourselves to see through the issues and the emotions to what God is asking of us. What's God's will in this situation? What do the scriptures say? What do church teachings say? More importantly, how can I become a holier person through this? And then we break. When we break, it involves sacrifice because we know we will never be the same again. So when we lift it up, we're actually breaking ourselves. We acknowledge the sacrifice that God is calling us to in that moment and how we are called to break ourselves. Break yourselves. It's changing. It's changing your mindset. It's changing your heart. It's changing your lives. And lastly, and most importantly, we share. We take our issues, we take our problems, and having prayed God's will for them, we offer them back to God, entrusting our wills into God's hands. And when we do this last step, what we're doing is we're seeking out a heavenly solution, God's solution, to our problems. Every Sunday when we come to church, as we prepare to celebrate the liturgy of the Eucharist, we're invited spiritually to place our problems, our issues, our intentions, and our struggles on the altar to be taken, to be blessed, to be broken, and to be shared with God. It is my hope today, it is my prayer today, that we may have the courage and the humility to do so. Then just like that large crowd in today's gospel, we will receive the abundant gifts that the Lord 
wishes to share with us.